am amazed at how many people have shared with me the needs and the concerns of their friends and their neighbors, prayer requests, trying to keep up with all of the activities on campus. And it's just, uh, it's amazing. Now, when I say activities on campus, I realize that a lot of that right now is, is limited, but we are trying so hard to put a lot of content on the TV channel and to make things available. I know that, uh, that our folks up in the health center and in the assisted living are trying to, to provide extra hands-on things there. If that's something that you are interested in, uh, please contact my office at extension 247 and we will try to put some, uh, put some items and some resources into your hands to kind of help you deal with these days. It is beautiful weather. Uh, it has just been an interesting week of, of prayer and of solitude, and as we've been trying to focus our attention upon these days and gathering our thoughts and using this time to kind of allow our souls to be rejuvenated, we are all looking forward to the time that we can all be back together again and try to get back to, uh, to life of some semblance of normal. So again, I thank you for joining us, and I trust that our time together today will be a time that will be a blessing to you. And as we're trying some new technology and trying to make things available, please try to understand we're all in a learning curve at this point. And uh, I'm learning things that I never thought possible. Uh, again, a shout out to, to Andy and to Colin and uh, the fact that we can work together to try to put together videos and to learn this technology it really has been exciting and hopefully when all of this is passed we will still have these tools at uh, at our ready so that we can utilize them every week and continue to bring you some good quality programming things that are inspirational and help you uh, to navigate these days now as i shared with you last week Every week we have a corporate prayer that has been written by someone, either by a resident or a chaplain, retired minister, whatever the case may be. We have these prayers that have been submitted. And this week I'm looking at a prayer from uh, Chaplain Taylor Phillips. She is the chaplain at Westminster Oaks in Tallahassee. And so I would like for us to just pause for a moment and to share this time of prayer as I read this prayer that she submitted for this week. Now, all of our facilities are sharing this prayer on Tuesday afternoons at 2 p.m. So by the time you hear this, our staff has already prayed this prayer yesterday, meaning Tuesday afternoon, but this being a Wednesday video, uh, just want you to, to understand kind of the time frame. But join with me, let's bow our heads as I read this prayer and we join our hearts together. Everlasting God, throughout this difficult time, we recall that you guided our ancestors and our spiritual ancestors through the flood, slavery, the plagues, the exodus, famines, wars, and persecutions. We remember that with your love, each generation before us has lived to see a better day. We know in our minds that we will make it through the situation before us as well. But we also humbly ask for your comfort and strength again and again with each passing day. In your name we pray, amen. And she shares this passage from Joshua, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. It's just a snippet. It says, I have given you and all my people the entire land. I will always be with you. I will never abandon you. What a nice thought for this afternoon, isn't it? Now, I'm going to be looking at Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. And if you have a Bible, join with me, uh, turning to that in your Bible. Again, I am reading from the New Living Translation, so it may read a little differently from the version you have in hand, 
But rest assured, again, the passage will come up on the screen so that you will be able to follow along right there on the channel, okay? Let's read this passage together. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters be addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings, as well as to the people of Israel and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went, Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching. He is indeed the Son of God. God's Word for God's people. Now, as we look at this passage, we have to understand that each of us has faced challenges in our lives that call into question our very ability of being able to trust in the leading and the provision of God. We have all struggled with our faith at some point in time. This passage is an interesting account from several perspectives of faith. We see the high priest. We see Saul, who will have his name changed to Paul. Those traveling with Saul will consider Ananias and the believers in Damascus. So first of all, we need to understand that God sees those who take things kind of faith into their own hands. Saul felt that he had done 
a very good job, and he felt that he still had a job to do. He felt, you see, that he was serving God by his perspective. He thought he was doing a good thing. He was engulfed by his intentions and his methods. So he really felt that he was doing something special. And in a lot of ways, he felt that he was doing God's bidding. Now, the high priest did not need to do anything but give permission for Saul to do what he was doing. Do we find ourselves in a struggle as we consider others and push forward with our own attitudes and our intentions? Do we feel that somehow we are in charge and we are the one that are calling all the shots? I know there have been times in my life that I really thought I was doing the right thing. But you know, there are several ways that we can do and perform a function. We can do things our way, do our things, our intentions, our way. We can try to do things uh, that God wants us to do in our way. And then we're hoping that God is going to do something in our way, but the proper way is to really do things God's way. God's thing. God's will, God's way. So sometimes we need a bit of an attitude adjustment. Sometimes we need to have a course correction and to realize that what we are doing is doing God's will, God's way. And if we can just get ourselves out of the way, we're fine that we will no longer take things into our hands. But this was the case that Saul was taking matters into his own hands, but thought that he had God's blessings on it. Oh, was he to learn an important lesson. Now, secondly of all, another group of people, God sees those who are handicapped in their vision. Now, Saul was unable to see the truth in the ministry and life of Jesus. He was educated in the law, but we find that he was kind of stuck there. His legalism prevented his grasp of the fulfilled prophecy that really was in Jesus, wasn't it? Now the travelers with Saul, though they heard, they were really unaffected. Why would they remain unchanged? They hear this voice, but they remain unchanged. They were caught between worlds, you see. They were caught between Saul and his determined vision, but then they were also caught between their world and acceptance in the Christian world in Damascus. These men were caught in the middle as well. Now, do we find ourselves in a struggle as we face bold truth and the uncertainty of life's circumstances? That's where we are today, isn't it? We know what God wants us to do. We have a life of faith, but we're trapped in our circumstances, so to speak. And we wonder, what are we going to do? How can God work in the midst of this situation and still allow me to have a ministry, to allow me to have a focus on the things of God when we feel so isolated and so trapped where we are? Now, thirdly, we also find that God sees those who question the outcome of obedience. Here's where Ananias comes into play. Ananias was a man of faith, and he was also a man of reason. A man of faith because he communicated with God. We read in this passage that he heard the voice of God, and he responded to the voice 
of God. Ananias was spoken to by God. Now, he was a man of reason because he could acknowledge the facts. He recognized that God was speaking to him. And he recognized the fact of the facts of the situation when he was told what he was going to do and who he was going to go see. Now, though Ananias heard the voice of God and responded, his obedience, we find, was not really immediate. There really was some debate. Ananias made a very good case. He said, you know, I know this man, Saul, and I know what he has done. I know best. And he knew this man, and they knew what could come to pass if he went to see Saul. But God intervened. God pointed out what was to come in Saul's life. God says, I'm going to use this man. Ananias was placed to a point of decision. Was he going to trust God or trust his own fears and his own apprehension? What was he going to do? How would we serve if we had the luxury of knowing the future? If we found ourselves in struggles, what is it that calls our faith to action? Ananias was caught in a difficult situation, and he found himself in a struggle that calls faith to action. So when we find ourselves in struggles and situations, are we willing to trust God's word? Even though something down deep inside of us says, you know, we really ought to be afraid. God's peace comes. And recognizing the voice of God and the will of God, we have something that we can stand on, don't we? If we find ourselves in that situation and we recognize the voice of God and we have trusted him in the past, now is the time to trust him afresh and anew today. Now, fourthly, God sees those whose faith is strengthened in the community. You see, the church in Damascus must have had a bit of a reputation. <laughs> Why would they be targeted if they were an insignificant group? Saul would not be coming to visit these people and to take them back in chains if they did not have a good faith reputation. Why would they be targeted if they were insignificant? I submit that they were a church of prayer. Saul's name in Hebrew meant prayed for. Think about that. That's what Saul's name meant in Hebrew. Prayed for. Later, his name would be changed to Paul, which in Hebrew, actually in Latin, it would mean little or small. We don't tend to think of Paul as being a man of little or small, do we? So who would be praying for Saul? And what would they be praying? Oh, how many times have we been called to prayer for a situation or an individual or a circumstance? We don't know exactly how God is going to work, but we know that God is certainly going to do something, don't we? Now, do we understand that Saul is ministered to by the very group that he was intended to persecute? 
he was being prayed for by the church in Damascus. And Ananias was going to go and lay hands on Paul and pray for him. Do we find ourselves in the struggle to participate in the community of faith? Are we participants or are we observers in a life of faith? Do we know our faith? Do we understand our faith? We know what we believe. We may even know why we believe. And we have an unshakable faith, but do we act upon it? Do we live it out? We are participants. We shouldn't be just observers. Do we pray with the intent of being used by God? Do we pray with the understanding that our prayers could have a significant impact? Do we understand the scriptures when it says that prayer moves the hand of God? Do we understand that when we pray, the word tells us that angels are dispatched at that moment to do the will of God? Folks, prayer is a powerful thing. So you may be in your apartment, you may be in your rooms, you may feel isolated, but prayer moves the hand of God and can make an incredible difference in the world for good. Do we see the impact of simple service? Do we understand that the very, the smallest of things that we do in the name of Jesus can have profound effects and can change the world around us? I hope I've given you a little bit of food for thought. the outcome in this account. Look to what resulted on all of the sides of the participants involved in this story. The high priest not only did not get what he intended, he lost his best tool in the process. The one that he could count on to carry out all of the persecution. This man named Saul now has a new name of Paul, the high priest lost one of his best warriors. Saul, who was blinded and out of control of his circumstances, was able to see with his eyes and with his heart in such a way that his ministry would change the world. Ananias was able to see beyond the challenges of his own narrow understanding and to see the possibilities in God. The Damascus church was affected as well. It was able to see the results of God's work through their prayer and take an active role in establishing a lasting ministry. Then those traveling with Saul seem to drop out of the story, but we can speculate how they might have responded as a result of Saul's conversion. Folks, let me give you this as a final thought. We never know all the possibilities when we respond in faith to the voice of God. This we do know. Faith-filled obedience can change lives and change the world. Amen? God can do amazing things in our lives, can't he, if we just give him an opportunity. Let us close now with the prayer that we close our chapel services with. We call this the Westminster Prayer, but it's really our prayer that we share with one another. And really this prayer is shared in a lot of facilities around the state. Let's pray together. Creator God, we ask you to bless our Westminster community and all who live and work within it. 
May this place be filled with deep caring, welcoming hospitality, and dedicated respect. May all who visit here be greeted with warmth and kindness. May all who live here be graced with God and peace. May all who serve here do so in the spirit of Jesus, whose deep love and dedication to healing touched all he encountered. Amen. Burdens too hard to bear at the end of my road. Troubles abound, life gets me down, so unable to cope. Then out of the blues, daylight breaks through, there's reason to hope. In the midst of my tears, Lord, I feel you so near. You send a Why the darkening clouds of sorrow and doubt should surround me so? 